sound. All of the dead shout. Right is meet in the skies. Going when no one dies. Heaven work by. Amen. Amen. It's certainly good to be back in the house one more time. Uh, and uh, we want to continue on in uh, our study of Matthew 4. Uh, if you remember now, the scripture says, then Jesus was uh, led by the Spirit uh, up to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Y'all remember that from this morning? That's what Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 1 says. And uh, one of the things, brothers and sisters, that uh, our mission is as we preach and teach through what it means to be wholehearted is we have to come to terms and come to grips with the fact that one, we are finite beings, meaning that we live in this world. We can only live one day at a time. Uh, we can only do certain things as human beings, but we serve a God who can do all things and not only can he do all things but he does all things well uh, and because of uh, us belonging to him there's certain experiences that we have to have that one uh, we don't necessarily understand why we have to go through it we may not agree with the fact that we have to go through it we may not enjoy having to go through it but living in this world uh, you are guaranteed some heartache and pain uh, we're going to have to experience some things we don't necessarily like, but they are designed by God because the God we serve always has a purpose. God does not do anything without a purpose. He is a God of purpose. He intends for things. He designs things to come out a certain way. And so because we follow a God and we love a God and we belong to a God who's very purposeful, that means our lives are filled with purpose. He has created us and when we follow him, uh, nothing happens by happenstance look or just because they are all in the grand scheme of God and so uh, what we want to do is to live our lives in such a way uh, where God can shape us mold us and help us to be the kind of people he called us to be but to do that you got to be real with yourself you got to understand who God is and you got to be ready for what uh, he has in store for you so this morning we introduced an idea that uh, there are five realities we have to come to grips with uh, in terms of, 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 of being wholehearted and, and following in the Lord. And I, I want to make sure y'all were listening now. Can somebody, I know this Sunday night, I understand this worship, and I'll take an a answer from a woman so you can shout it out. What, what was the first one? Anybody remember? What's the first thing? Oh, y'all took notes. Now, see, look at that. That's all right, Brother Davis. They were listening. It works. It works. People do listen. All right. That, that temptation often follows confirmation. The Bible says that the moment Jesus is confirmed that he is the son of God, the spirit of God descends upon him. A, a voice speaks from heaven and says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The Bible says then Jesus was ushered away by the spirit into the wilderness. The moment we make up our mind to follow of God, guess what happened? Satan shows up. Don't he show up? The moment you set your mind to do right, Satan shows up. You know, you're going to hold your tongue and be a mature Christian and then somebody cut you off. Amen. Somebody comes in and says something to get your blood pressure racing. Amen. We, the moment we decide we're going to live for God, the moment we decide that I'm going to get right and stay right, that's the moment when Satan shows up and throws salt in the game. Am I right about it? Don't Satan have a tendency to do that? Uh, but we got to come to terms with the fact that that's a part of the Christian walk. You don't escape that. You, you don't, you, you're not, you, 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 you're not, uh, you don't have the special blessing of being able to avoid pitfalls and trouble. Uh, Satan's going to come after you. And I always tell folk all the time, listen, you must be doing something right if Satan is on your tail. If Satan ain't bothering you, more than likely he already considers you one of his. You want him to be on you. Amen. If Satan not bothering you, he already figured he got you. Amen. So it's imperative to understand that, that temptation comes uh, after confirmation. Now, the second thing, now do y'all remember the second one? The second one is what? Spirit-led living 
means you got to walk in the unknown. That's all right. I'm possessed of these folk. I feel like a good teacher. I do. I'm going to have to give y'all bullet points every Sunday. Lord, y'all can keep up with my points here. Listen, you got to understand following God means you're not going to necessarily know where we're going. Abraham stepped out on faith without knowing. And Abraham was an old man when he did it. Y'all know he was 75 years old when he decided, I'm going to leave where I live. I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to take my wife who can't get pregnant and my nephew Lot, and we're going to follow what God has said. And God never told him where he was going to end up. He just said, come on and follow. And do you know they follow? The disciples did not know when Jesus called them from being fishermen to follow him, what they were going to have to endure. But they were willing to follow if we're going to follow the Lord, if we're going to be led by the Holy Spirit, we may not know the route we're going to take to get where we're going to go, uh, but one day we're going to get there. Amen. Now, let me get y'all confessions of a new preacher. This is the confessions of a new preacher. I started to do some of these in my sermon so y'all can understand where brother's coming from. Listen, listen, I, I'm not sure of where the Lord is going to take Crenshaw. But I don't need to know where we're going to have faith that God is going to get us there. Oh, y'all miss what I said. A preacher is everything going fine at the church. As long as God is in control, everything's all right. That's all right. That's right. As long as God is in control, everything's all right. Why they talking about you? I hear rumors. That's all right. God is still in control. And if God is in control, it's all right by me. So we got to go through the rumor meal. Amen. God is with me and I'm ready to go. Amen, Walls. Amen. Well, Brother Moore, what we going to do about space? How we going to deal with all these? We'll just deal with it when we get there. I don't know where God is going to take us. I don't know if it's a third service. I don't know if it's buy another building. I don't know if it's floor this building. We going to build a new one. I just know the Lord going to see us through. Amen. When people ask you, well, how you going to make it next month? Well, if the Lord allow me to see next month, we'll deal with it when we get there. Amen, walls. Oh, brother Moore, you're not going to have the money to pay this bill next week. Well, it ain't next week yet. <laughs> Amen. God got six days to come through with something. He created the whole world in six days. He could come up with $258 to pay this car note. Amen. Amen, Amen walls. If, if, if God can create the whole world and say, if I got six days to pay a bill, I know God is going to come through. Hey Amen. That's just the second thing. Now, the third thing, the third thing I ask you to write down, and we're going to just discuss this one thing, and, and uh, I'm going to give you the message. It'll be yours. That is that the wilderness is not necessarily a bad thing now. And we got to be comfortable sometimes hanging out in the wilderness. We got to get comfortable with that. And many of us find ourselves in our own particular wildernesses. Your wilderness can be in your personal life with your struggle to walk obedient with God. Been there, done that. It can be in your family life. Your marriage may not be where it should be. You and Mrs., you and Mr., he may not be on the same page with you. And you can find yourself in a fog wilderness experience. You could be on your job. Amen. And, and you've been there long enough. You got seniority, but you know they laying out folks and cutting back. And they willing to fire you and hire somebody half your age and pay them half the money. I need somebody who know what I'm talking about. My mama know what I'm talking about. Where, where they come in, they look at you and how much you demand and make, and they can get somebody half your age to come do your job twice as fast and pay them half as much money as they pay you. And you know your job is on the chopping block. And you go to work every day just thankful that you got a job, but the moment your supervisor say, can I see you, you get nervous. See me for what? Amen. Can't you just tell me now? Do I have to come to your office for you? You scared to go be by yourself with a supervisor? You, you can be on your own personal wilderness. There are folk in this room who have been sick before. Doctors don't necessarily know what's wrong. You know you feel pain. It's real to you. But you take all the tests and the doctors say, I, I, listen, I, the worst feeling to have is when you're in pain and people don't believe you. Oh, that's the worst feeling to have. Because they almost make you feel like you're crazy. And you know good and well something wrong with you. And you can't get nobody to at least say, I think something wrong with you too. 
Amen. I had that problem when I was a child. It was, I struggled. There was a time when I had hurt my hips and I didn't know uh, that my hips were hurt and it, it made the pain radiate another area in my body and I was, you know, thought my knees were toe up, Brother Davis, and, and the doctors looking at me and said, oh, ain't nothing wrong with him. And I said, well, if it ain't nothing wrong with me, why am I limping? You know, I'm thinking to myself, I, something got to be wrong. And then, and then, you know, the doctors didn't convince my mom and daddy that it ain't nothing wrong. So now I'm like, oh, now hold on. I didn't lost all my advocates. The doctors say ain't nothing wrong. My mom and daddy say ain't nothing wrong. Now, I'm still hurting. Amen. And, and, and I walked around for two months in a fog. That's, that was a wilderness experience. When, when you get off by yourself, sometimes you go through things and you don't have answers. You got questions with no answers. You have issues nobody can relate to. And you, you can find yourself by yourself. But I want you to watch this. When the spirit leads you to the wilderness, you're not alone. When the spirit is in control, you, you, you're not necessarily by yourself. You, you, you need to call on God because God lives in the wilderness too. Oh, y'all missing this. God lives in the wilderness too. Now let me show you what this looks like and we're going to go home. Many of us find ourselves in the middle of a wilderness experience. We in some way feel lost, frustrated, or even confused about our surroundings. We have seemingly made a wrong turn and find ourselves in a place that we did not intend. It is here where we feel the most vulnerable. Anybody ever felt vulnerable before? However, it is in the wilderness where God provides the most. When Israel left Egypt, they did so with little more than faith in God. After God had delivered them from Pharaoh and his army, Israel experienced something very unique and special. It was in the wilderness where complete dependence on God was cultivated. Israel had to depend on God for food and water. Israel had to depend on God for protection against her enemies. It was in the wilderness where we are incapable of doing our own thing, making our own way, and determining our own outcome. See, it's the wilderness where God got to show you that he alone is your provider. It's in the wilderness where you learn that God alone is your protector. It's in the wilderness where God show you just how good he is. It's in the wilderness when you realize you can't do for yourself and you got nothing but faith for God who going to bring you through. The wilderness is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, now, what happens to us is that when we feel vulnerable and uncomfortable as humans, we don't like that because we want to be in control. But can you call yourself a child of God and then claim to be in control? Isn't that oxymoronic? It can't really happen, right? You can't say you trust in God to do it for you do it with you and do it to you and at the same time claim that you're doing it for yourself you can't have the best of both worlds now either you gonna trust and obey or you gonna do it your way oh I think somebody need to tweet that that was pretty good post that on Facebook uh, uh, put that on Twitter now you, you, you either gonna trust and obey or you gonna do it your own way you, you can't have both of them. And God takes us into the wilderness so that we can learn how to appreciate who he is. All right, all right, all right. Israel leaves Egypt. They get over on the other side of the Red Sea. Bible says that the water came crashing back down on Pharaoh's army. Pharaoh's army died in the Red Sea. Y'all remember that? The moment they got on dry land and came across, God killed off their enemies. They look back and they see the people pursuing them have just died. God gave them victory. But do you know where they found themselves on the dry side of the river? That was the beginning of their wilderness experience. Oh, y'all missed that. I said God had just delivered them and gave them victory. And the moment they stepped out of the jaws of death, they stepped into the wilderness. Oh, don't y'all miss it. Didn't we just say the temptation comes after confirmation? God just proved to him, I got your back. God just proved to him, it's going to be all right. God just proved to him, uh, I, I, I'm going to protect you. And they stepped right on the dry land into the wilderness. Y'all see how that worked? Y'all see how that worked? Now, it was in the wilderness 
where they started to grumble and complain because they didn't particularly care for living in the wilderness. See, when they were in Egypt, now Egypt wasn't their homeland, Brother, Brother Bear. That wasn't their land. And they worked for the other man. Oh, and I'm talking your talk now, right? They worked for the man. Y'all hear what I said? And the man put the work on them so hard, Brother Davis, not only were they supposed to build, but they had to make up their own mud to make bricks and then build. I mean, that's cold, right? I mean, come on now. And, and, and the Bible says that, that the, the Pharaoh used to treat them wrong. And he used to put so much work on them that they couldn't stand it. As a matter of fact, when God called Moses, he tells Moses, I have heard the cry of my people. And I want you to go down there and get them out of there. Y'all remember that? Okay, now they leave out. They leave out of Egyptian bondage. But now they got to totally depend on God. But they get out and the first thing they bellyache about is food. Y'all see that? And they complained against Moses and they said, you could have left us in Egypt. You brought us all the way out here to die. At least at home we had greens and turnips and see y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. We, we was eating good. But now we stuck out here and ain't no food. And you know the scripture says that the Bible that God literally had manna provided for them on, on the ground. So all they had to do when they woke up in the morning was just go out there and pick it up. Now, I know I'm not preaching Exodus right now, but I just got to say this while I'm here. Listen, listen. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to plant. They didn't have to reap no soul, right? And God just fed them. And all they had to do was just pick up enough for that day. Now, watch this. There was a rule on it. Y'all remember the rule? God said, now, you only pick up enough for the day. Now, don't you go trying to get seconds for tomorrow. You know why? Because God don't deal with leftovers. Oh, y'all missed what I said. I said, God don't deal in leftovers. He got a new blessing for you waiting on you tomorrow. Y'all know y'all living on new mercy that's just designed for Sunday, April, what's today? April the what? April the 12th. You, your mercy you living on right now was dispatched by God early this morning when he touched you and woke you up. But do you know tomorrow you're going to get some Monday, April the 13th mercy? You know why? Because the Bible said God mercies are new every morning. We're we, we not going to live on no leftovers tomorrow. So God said, you only pick up what you need for the day. You leave the rest of it down there. And matter of fact, God put it on them so tough that when they tried to save it, thinking that he wasn't going to provide the next day, he made the man a rot to show them you don't trust me, do you? You don't trust me. I said I'm going to keep providing. So, so they were living. They were living off the manor. But then they got thirsty. Y'all know that? So here they are in the middle of the desert. They're in the wilderness. And they had no water. And, and, and Moses was told to go over to the rock and hit the rock. And water was going to. Can I just ask y'all a question? I'm not a, a, a botanist. I guess that's plants. What's the rock? Archaeologist. What's the rock? I study of the rocks. What's the uh, geologist? I don't, but I don't know too many rocks that is a source for water. I, I, I mean, I, I know I didn't do that well in geology, but I don't think water is supposed to come from a rock. But you notice how, how because they were in the wilderness, God had to do some extraordinary. Oh, y'all missing this. See, see, when you're in the wilderness, you don't know where your blessing might come from. See, so, so, so when it shows up, you ought to take it. Listen, listen, a couple, three years ago, I was, I was in, a, in a definite wilderness experience, and I was, I was in a fog. I literally was, and I, I was struggling. I was fighting off, trying to be depressed because it was getting me down. Satan was really on me, and um, I, was, I was just, I mean, I was trying to worship, and I just couldn't, and I just felt, ugh. And, and so one day, I was driving, and I was up on Overhill in Stockholm. Y'all know that intersection with La Brea, Overhill, and stuff. What is, there's a man who used to play the guitar 
or the saxophone. Okay, when the guitar was a ukulele. Or he played his saxophone. And then sometimes he had a trumpet. Y'all know that guy? All right, I passed by that guy every day taking my kids to school. And, and you know he wasn't all together there. And, and, and so one day I'm going in, I'm in my fog, and, and I just happened to roll up Brother Davis, and my window was down. And so he comes up, and he's, his thing is, I'm going to play you a song. You give me some change. So he comes up to the car, and he's got, like, white blonde hair. I mean, it's just really, really blonde. It's platinum. That's what it is. And, and he, comes up to the, he comes up to the window, and he says, sir, you can't let Satan win. <laughs> and I looked at him. And I said, say what? He said, no, you can, I, he calls Satan some expletives I can't name uh, in front of y'all, amen. But he said, you can't let that so-and-so win. Now he'll take your joy from you if you let him. And, and he said, I just wanted to share that with you. And I reached down in my cup holder and I grabbed about $8 of nickels and I blessed that man for blessing me. I certainly did. And I run, I made my right and came down stock and I said, Lord, I think you just gave me a word and you took a crazy man with a ukulele to do it. And I resolved myself, Satan ain't going to win. That so-and-so ain't going to get me. Amen when you can. Amen when you can. God will bless you in some unique ways when you're in your wilderness. He'll he, he, he come through a thing you never saw coming. You didn't even know water could come from a rock. And he'll bless you from some crazy places. Amen when you can. Oh, boy. It is in the wilderness where we find out just how good God is. We watch him work it out in our favor, make it right, keep us from harm, make something out of nothing, cover us up, keep our enemies at bay, and make our stops go. You know God can make your stop go. Lord have mercy. I said God can make you stop, go. Somebody else tell you to stop and God tell you to go and his go outweigh and overrun their stop. Amen. amen. You have been told you too old, amen. You've been told you too young. You've been told you don't make enough money. You've been told you make too much money. You've been told you can't do something. Somebody else telling you to stop, but God's go overrun their stop. Amen, boys. Amen, amen. The wilderness is where we learn to trust God. The wilderness is where we learn to lean on God. And I want you to watch this. The wilderness is where we learn to believe on God. Now, there's a difference between believing in God and believing on God. Believing in God is the rational thinking that there is a supreme being out there beyond the stars and that he exists. You may believe that he was incarnated as Jesus Christ. You can believe that he walked among men. You can believe that his Bible is the engrafted word of God. But it's one thing to believe in God and there's another thing to believe on God. Believing on God is when you take his word as truth and fact and don't let no one or nobody or anything turn you around from that. Now, I always ask the question, especially when people struggle financially or physically in their body. And they ask the question, is God going to bring me through and I always ask folk do you believe that God has saved you you believe he saved you so that he sent Jesus to die and made a way out of no way that you can have a relationship with him and those that believe in him are called his children he gave us rights to be sons and daughters of God do you believe that and most people say yes I believe God has saved me and my question is well if you believe that God has saved you do you also believe that God will keep you? Well, um, um, I don't know. Well, hold on now. You believe that God has saved your soul? Yes. But you don't believe God can help you come through this sticky situation? 
Oh, that's a real question to ponder now. I want us to think about that. If you believe, if you trust God with your soul salvation, don't you trust him with your mortgage? I mean, come on now. Can we just be real talk real quick right in here? Listen, yo, Mar all they going to do is put you out your house. If you trust God to save your soul, the wretched man and woman that you are, don't you trust him to keep you? No, we struggle with that. Because we don't believe God can pay a bill. We don't believe God can tell doctors not yet. Mm -mm, uh uh, not yet. Not with her. Uh uh. Cancer ain't taking her. Amen. You can send him on home on hospice if you want to. Hospice gonna go back on home where they came from because I'm not done with him yet. If you believe God will save your soul, can't you give him your bills? Can't you give him your family members as wayward, hard to talk to, hard head? Can't you give him those folk too? If I trust him to save my soul, I definitely can trust him with my relationships with people I don't care for that much. Amen. I can trust him with that. Amen. Let's go home. I want to I wanna give you one more slide and we're going to be done. Typically, your wilderness experiences is an isolation from others. It is the place where your friends can't go or relate to. It is the place where you find yourself by yourself with God alone. It is the place where you can't run from God. Is a place where you come face to face with your creator without anyone or any place to run. Y'all remember when we preached through Psalm 139? This is a beautiful passage of scripture, Psalm 139. I want to read beginning at verse number seven, and the sermon will be yours. David says, where can I go from your spirit? And where can I flee from your presence? David says, if I ascend into heaven, guess what? You're there. If I make my bed in hell, King James says, she old, the underworld. Behold, God's even in the underworld. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. I, I just, I just want to show y'all this. Listen, David says that no matter what I try to run, I can't outrun the Lord. No matter where you find yourself tonight, church, God is there. God has not left you. He does not forsake you. And he doesn't leave you by yourself. Now, your friends may not be able to relate to your issue. Your family members may not be able to understand your plight. They may not have any empathy nor sympathy for what you're going through. But there is a God. And he is alive. And I want us to watch this, brothers and sisters, no matter how far you try to run, you can't outrun God. Because the scriptures say, David says, if he goes to heaven, guess what? Is there. If he goes to hell, guess what? God is there. As a matter of fact, one, one version says, God is all the way on the east and all the way on the west, all the way on the north and all the way on the south, all the way at the same time. It ain't a rock you can crawl under. A cave you can hide in that God cannot go to. So if you find yourself tonight in the midst of a wilderness, it's a good thing. And it's good because we trust that God has us in places that's designed to draw us closer to him. So when I find myself not having anybody to talk to that can understand what I'm going through, that's when I have to learn to talk to the Lord. A few years back, going through some things, I had to learn that the only person that I trust in this whole wide world is the Lord. Love my mama, love my wife, but at the end of the day, I trust only one person. And that's to love my elders, love my deacons, love my brother Barry and I real close. Listen, I, I only trust the Lord because the moment I put my trust in men and women, I'm going to get let down. So to keep from being let down, I trust God and him alone to hear me when I cry, to relate to me when I struggle, and to love me when I'm unlovable. See, the wilderness is not necessarily bad thing 
It was in the wilderness when Israel first learned that God had them and he wasn't going to let them go. It was in the wilderness where Israel had to learn that God was going to protect and provide. It was in the wilderness when they realized they were going to walk on shoes for 40 years and the souls wasn't going to ever run out. That's where they learned that God could make something out of nothing. And God can prolong things that should have burnt out long time ago. Did he, did he not? Did he not show Elijah and the widow? That if you just take this last little bit and make it for me, you have more in your pot than you realize you had. God can provide and make. Did he not take two small fish and five barley loaves? The Bible says he said, make the men sit down. I want the greedy folks to sit down first. The ones that eat a lot. Matter of fact, sit them in the 50s. Y'all remember the story? The Bible says Jesus began to pray. He, the Bible says he looked up to heaven and prayed. You know, what's interesting is he never looked at the food. He just looked up. He let God worry about the food. And he started handing it out. So much so, the scripture, once, one account says they had 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, you know they was doing some eating. If they had enough to fill 12 baskets with leftovers, God can take a little bit and keep providing and providing and providing. But you only learn that in the wilderness. Can we start to embrace the wilderness? We have to learn how to embrace it and not let it drive us away from God, but help us to drive closer to God. If you're here, you're not a member of the Lord's church. Jesus lived a sinless life and died on Calvary for sinners like you and me because he loved us so. Scripture says that he hung, bled, and died on the cross, giving his life and then taking it back up again because early on Sunday morning, Scripture say that he rose from the dead. And his empty tomb proves that our Savior lives. You come to him by faith. It's hearing and believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ and being willing to repent of your sins and to confess with your mouth that he's the Christ. Be baptized, buried in water for the remission of your sin. That's what baptism is for. It's for the remission add you to the body of Christ. Remain faithful unto death and heaven to be your home. But I, I'm going to be honest with you. It's home folks in here tonight. Many of us have been born and raised in the church, been members of the church for a long time. And many of us find ourselves in a wilderness experience and typically we pray to God that he get us out of here. <laughs> and I just stopped by to let you know maybe you need to take a seat <laughs> and get used to it. Because God just might be showing you how good he is while you find yourself in the midst of your wilderness experience. If you're here and you need prayer for something bigger than you, it's certainly not bigger than God. Will you come? Will you come right now? It's together we stand. To live, I am learning. To live, I am learning. Learning to live. On Jesus, and I'm finding more power than I ever dreamed. It's in the wilderness where we learn to lean on Jesus. Am I right about it? Learning to lean on Jesus. Learning to live, I am learning. I'm learning to live. 